This is Innocent, a newborn baby in Zambia, one of the poorest countries in Africa. What are his opportunities in a world where the gap between rich and poor is still growing? Where the wealthiest 1% possess about 40% of the global wealth, and the three richest billionaires own more than the 58 poorest countries combined? In a world where 600 million children live in extreme poverty, and where 19,000 children die of poverty every day, that is one child every four and a half seconds. Where food prices are on the rise again, where nearly one and a half billion people have to get by on $1.25 per day, the poverty line. That means half a loaf of bread in Europe or the US. Another three billion people live on $2 a day, which means a kilo of potatoes in developed countries. Where 300,000 women die during childbirth because of medical complications which can be easily treated in the developed world. And where the babies of these deceased mothers have up to 10 times the risk of not reaching their second birthday. Where the life expectancy in Zambia is 52 years, compared with 81 years in the Netherlands. Where globally, 80% of children go to school, but in Western and Central Africa, 40% do not. In the whole of Africa, over 45 million children do not go to school, which means that they will lack the education to be able to work their way out of poverty. During this film, another 25 children have died of hunger-related diseases. Is there no hope at all? Yeah, <laughs> is there no hope at all? Pretty grim statistics. Um, and um, let me say thanks to Tiana for putting that together for us. It's an important context for us to have, uh, as hard-nosed as those statistics as those realities are. They are global realities. And um, yeah, it's an important context, an important background for us to have. Um, welcome tonight to, um, to service with us here. Um, and uh, let me just say, my name is Steve Early. I'm a member here. Um, I've been asked to speak to this particular question, how should Christians respond to poverty? And I'm going to give it a good effort. I'll be honest with you, I've, I've found this a very, very difficult topic to speak to, to prepare for. Very convicting, very challenging. I think I've sweated a, full, a few bullets over this one. Um, trying to, to get a a biblical picture in place, and, and certainly because we're talking about, as you see, what on the face of it is such an overwhelming issue or topic, um, and one which tends to bring with it um, so much despair. I, I feel it's important not to leave us with despair. That's really not where we need to, to stop. Uh, so, Having all that as a brief, having all that before me, that's the effort that I've made. Pray with me as we have a look at uh, God's Word and as we look at this issue. Father, we, we are grateful that as we sit here, and it has to be said very comfortably in this church, worshiping in freedom and in peace and in stability tonight, all of us well-fed, well-cared for, well-covered, that we know that we're blessed. And um, the fact that we we recognize that these blessings come from you, um, is itself something that you had to break through into our hearts to make clear to us. Uh, we thank you that you set us apart for that purpose and that you, for some reason, saw fit to do that for each one of us, to break through um, everything that stood between us to help us to see just how blessed we are and how, how the very lives that you've given us and everything you've given us to make those lives full and rich and even comfortable are all gifts from you ultimately. Um, we thank you that we can be here and, and that we can be here in gratitude. And I pray that as a people tonight, um, particularly around your word, worshiping you, glorifying you, that, that there would certainly be an element of gratitude to what we offer back to you because you deserve it. You have been generous to us. And Father, we also recognize there are a lot of people in the world that we live in, this fallen world that we currently live in, that aren't so blessed. And um, we ask with open hearts tonight, Father, before you, that you would teach us about what it means to be blessed in a world that knows so much uh, brokenness and lack of blessing. Teach us what it means. Teach us how to be your people in the midst of that. Teach us how not to be afraid or overwhelmed by the, the statistics and the pictures that the world throws at us, but to keep our focus on you, on your infinite goodness, on your power, on the unlimited wealth that's available to you and on your generous spirit. And I pray that you would help us with all of those things in mind and in balance 
be able to turn our, our gaze back to the world and look for the place where we can make a difference for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen. How should, a Christian, how should Christians respond to poverty? Well, how we frame that question is going to have a lot with how we set about addressing it. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Poverty is, a, is an abstract principle. It's an idea. It's a big thing. It's something, as you see, uh, in a global sense, is, is very big. And those statistics, especially coming at you sort of one after the other like that, after the first two or three, you, you, you sort of stop to take it in, don't you? It's like, okay, I know the world is a very fallen place. I know there are a lot of people out there who, who suffer because it's a fallen place. I know that poverty is real. And I know that I don't know what it means to live like in that kind of poverty. But an awful lot of people do, and they suffer. It's a big thing. And it's very easy framing the question that way as an abstract thing, poverty, this idea, to sort of write it off, to put it in the too hard basket and, and assign that one to, um, to governments, to big agencies and institutions, um, World Vision or Save the Children or MSF, uh, and to say they need to deal with it. This is a big thing that only governments, non-government organizations, the UN, I don't know, maybe Bono can deal with on that sort of a scale. It's big. It's too big for me. But that's just the problem with labeling that, labeling it that, starting with that as our question. And, the, and really, really the simple answer to that question, to sort of bring it back down to size, how should we, should we as Christians respond to poverty? To borrow the answer from Mother Teresa, it's one person at a time, right? Let's scale this back down because that's really the biblical picture that we have. We can, we can even sort of, and sometimes do, I, 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 I certainly have I've heard this point, um, and probably you have too. We can even sort of Christianize that, that big picture, sort of very awkward, awesome, overwhelming sense of poverty in its uh, sort of unlimited scope. We can even Christianize that by um, uh, quoting that passage in uh, Matthew's Gospel, Matthew uh, uh, chapter 26, where Jesus says to his followers, well, the poor you shall have with you always. And you've heard people say that in, in the face of believers, say that in the face of poverty. Look, God's going to deal with that. Um, you know, it's really not our agenda. We need to get on with the gospel. The gospel is what makes all the difference. And, um, you know, leave that to God. And even Jesus said, the poor you shall have with you always. It's a, it's a constant thing. It's something that's going to be there till the end of time. Um, and we need to keep our focus, right? Uh, well, First of all, I think, uh, now I, I, I need, probably need Anne's help at this point, being the uh, biblical languages scholar that she is. But if I'm not mistaken, what Jesus really says at that moment more accurately is, the poor are always with you, but I am only here for a short period of time. So he wasn't saying what we tend to give him credit for saying, or sometimes even accuse of him saying, um, you shall have the poor with you. It's inevitable, and this is going to go on forever. That's really not behind what Jesus was actually saying. It was more like the poor are around all the time. And the assumption is you're dealing with that in some fashion. But this is a special moment. I'm only here for a short period of time. So let's, let's not accuse Jesus of pointing to something or setting us up for an expectation that he, he didn't intend. That's not the way that Matthew cast that. But the other thing is that um, the Bible doesn't speak of poverty, almost not at all. And Jesus, more especially, doesn't speak of poverty even less. Jesus talks about the poor. He talks about poor people. He talks about your neighbor who doesn't have a coat. He talks about your brother who's starving. First and foremost, for Jesus, the poor are people. And that passage that uh, I quoted in Matthew 26 is actually, Jesus is referring back to the passage that um, Elisa read for us tonight from the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 15. Um, there's a longer passage there than the one that we read, 
Um, but let me, let me follow up with her reading. For there will never cease to be poor in the land, the passage says. But it goes on to say, therefore I command you, you shall open, up, you should op- you should open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. And so the conclusion that we should really be drawing, if we read that passage as it was quoted in its real context, is the presence of those who need is the calling for us to respond, right? And certainly in that Old Testament setting, as the people of Israel, Jesus, uh, God was setting that before them as, as, a, as an important ethic for their society. This is how you're meant to live. And there's more. We're going to come back to that. There's a lot more to that passage. Um, but let's get that, even just that particular verse, back sort of in its right place. And so the question is, if, if the presence of the need is the calling, well, why, why are we reluctant? Because we are reluctant, aren't we? Um, I mean, maybe, maybe I can only speak for myself on this, but I think... Uh, and it's not that I mean to imply, I think as a church, I think as a particular congregation, I think we're, we're even a particularly generous community of believers. But we are reluctant. We're reluctant to really ask the hard questions about the poor that Jesus particularly challenges us with. Are there people we could help? Are there people who don't have a coat to whom we could give a coat? Are there people who are starving that we could feed? They're pretty simple and they're pretty basic questions. And our response, although I think probably most everyone here at some point and in some way gives, that reluctance, that inner reluctance, sometimes out of fear, sometimes out of something else, nevertheless, that reluctance to respond and, into the, and to respond in a way, in a sense, that is just an overwhelming character of the picture that the Bible gives us. Where does that come from? Well, I think, let me offer this suggestion at any rate, to try to get into a little bit into the psychology of this. There are sort of two prevalent views of economics in the world at the moment. Um, and then you're all going to click off at this point. He said that word, economics. Oh, man. How could you talk about economics at this time on a Sunday night? I'll make it really brief. Please, bear with me. I know, I know the response that world economics is likely to bring, but I'll try to make it brief. So there are two prevalent views at the moment. One is called zero-sum economics. And the idea behind that, in very broad terms, is that there is a finite and limited amount of global wealth. And the question of poverty or dealing with poverty is really a question of how to redistribute what is essentially a finite amount, a set amount. It may, be, it may not be a, a, an exactly determined amount, but it's, it's finite. And the question is, how do we redistribute that and, and, and spread it around so that it's more evenly spread? So that's one view. The other view is sort of the wealth creation model. That is, that wealth is not really limited or finite. It's only limited by our potential to create new wealth and to devise methods or innovations that actually make what we have produce even more wealth. It's a little more complicated, but those, those are sort of the two prevalent views in world economics at the moment. And the one assumes that basically the pot is a, is a limited pot. It's a set pot. It's got boundaries to it. And Beyond a certain point, we're never going to get more. The other one basically says, well, based on human ingenuity, the potential is, is really unlimited, or at least we, we don't see the end yet. And both of those views are very much the views of the world. When we look at our own resources, now I'm talking about us as believers, when we look at what we have, we tend to approach that, we tend to look at that, I think, with one or the other of those viewpoints. It's limited. Um, what I have is part of what is essentially a very limited, much bigger whole. And um, there's only so much to go around. And I need to have what I need to have 
for whatever reasons, whatever I've decided is the appropriate lifestyle, whatever my needs are, that what I have comes from that limited pot. And so, basically, let me get what I need for myself. And if somehow I manage to get more than that, okay, let's talk about what I can do with that to help other people. And the other sort of standpoint can be sort of along the lines of, well, it's a question of stewardship. If I manage what I have astutely and cleverly, I can, I can breed more from that. I can, you know, I can create more. And that's the extra. That's the more from which, the surplus from which I can, I can give. As much as we tend to get our, our, our view, our basic understanding of our resources, of our own resources, from either of those backgrounds, which are essentially kind of the world view on, on wealth, we've missed something really critical, haven't we? It's not a biblical view of wealth. It's a worldly view of wealth. It, it, even the basic understanding of what wealth is and where it comes from. We'll, we'll have a look at this passage again a little later on, but what is the source of wealth ultimately? Maybe the best answer to that question is, who is the source of wealth? Of everything that we have, where does that all come from ultimately? I don't think, I don't want to imply, I certainly don't want to imply that stewardship of the resources that you have, that any of us has, is an unchristian thing and that you lack faith to plan and to use that carefully. I, I, you know, I very badly don't want to give that impression and I hope that's not what you're hearing. And in fact, one of the messages, the, the, the sermon that John Wesley preached, the second most favorite sermon that he preached through his life was a, was a sermon called The Use of Money. And it's, it's quite an interesting sermon. And he lays out some really, um, some really helpful sort of uh, principles in that sermon. One of the things he talks about as a, as a sort of a Christian understanding of the use of money is, um, in a sense, a kind of a hierarchy of needs. And he, and he does this all in the context of stewarding what God has given us. And he says, yes, of course, it's, it's appropriate, it's even biblical for us to provide for our family as believers, to provide for our families first and to do that thoughtfully, modestly and comfortably, not excessively, modestly. And he even uses the word comfortably. But yes, it's appropriate for us to provide for our families first, okay? As believers, as Christians. And then after that, whatever remains beyond our needs to do that adequately, then to provide for the family of God. That's the next tier out. And then he says, anything beyond that, for others. And he, and he gives a really solid biblical basis and background for each one of those levels. And he's really arguing strongly on behalf of the need for Christians to be wise, to be astute, and to be thoughtful about how they steward what God has given them. But you hear the assumption that's different behind all of that, don't you? It's the resources that God has given them. That's the operative part. That's the important part. And the question behind our thinking about this isn't a question of stewardship. It's the question behind that. There's only so much to go around, and I have to compete for my part of what there is. And as long as I have something left, someone else is going without. That's not the biblical assumption. The biblical assumption is the source of wealth, as much as the source of wealth is God and the source of everything is God, that source is limitless. It's not finite. It's not a pot with boundaries around it. It's infinite. God, God and God's wealth are infinite. Let's go on, let's go back to this passage in, in Deuteronomy because it says a little bit more about this uh, that I think helps, again, get this notion of stewardship back into its proper perspective. At the end, so chapter 15 of Deuteronomy, okay? And beginning at the first part of that chapter, chapter 15 of Deuteronomy, says this, at the end of seven years, you shall grant a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release what he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor, 
his brother, because the Lord's release has been proclaimed. Of a foreigner, you may exact it. Now, let me just stop at that point and say, okay, those of you who are looking for a loophole here and hoping that I've just given you one, this is Old Testament. New Testament does away with that distinction for us now. There are no more foreigners left in the family of God, right? So you can, you can sort of quickly put that loophole off to the side. Um, it isn't really a loophole at all. But at any rate, of a foreigner, you may exact it. But whatever of yours is with your brother, you, uh, your hand shall release. But there will be no poor among you, for the Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess. If only you will strictly obey the voice of the Lord your God. Hear that very carefully. But there will be no poor among you. That's the first part of Deuteronomy. And get what he's really saying there. Guess what's, get what's really written there. Having given this command to generously forgive debts that have been incurred by, by fellow Israelites, by brothers. God is telling the Israelites, look, don't worry, this is not going to impoverish you. That's, that's the point of what he's saying. He's not saying there won't be any poor people at all. He's saying, in as much as you're able and willing to follow through with this, you needn't worry, worry about becoming poor. That sense of zero sum of the finite limits of the wealth that's available. But there will be no poor among you. You don't need to worry about that because, why? The Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess. God is generous. God will provide for you. He will provide for you enough generously so that you can care for other people as they have need. And even ultimately, when the time comes, if the debt is still outstanding, wipe the slate clean and start over. That's the character of the God who provides for us. And of course, we understand that the resources of the God who provides for us are without limit. But it's important to, to keep that straight because that's really the answer to the question as believers that we sometimes fall back on. Uh, isn't, you know, isn't it sort of like, am I not taking a risk if I give, you know, if I give unwisely, if I give too much? If we're giving with a sense that others well, if, we have, if we still have something left for ourselves, that means that others are going without, then we've gone too far the other direction. We've made the same mistake. We have discounted, we've, we've missed the point of the generosity of God and the generous nature of God. But we should be very careful that we're not using that as an excuse on the other end, basically to deny the possibility that God can bless, that he does bless, that it is in fact his character to bless, that he's generous in blessing, and that he is unlimited in the resources that are available for him. I, I was going to tell this story at the beginning because I had a different point to make with it, but I'm going to, I'm going to fit it in here, I think. Um, living in Addis Ababa and working at the, the mission headquarters there in Addis Ababa, it's right in the heart of the city, I would often go for a walk from the mission headquarters down the street. There are coffee, little coffee houses all over Addis Ababa. You can't hardly throw a rock without hitting a coffee cup in Addis Ababa. And good coffee too, of course, Ethiopian coffee. So um, it's just the done thing at, at, at a, you know, a certain point in time. And, and it can get to be fairly regular too because coffee is really cheap there. But at any rate, I had my coffee routine and then I would walk down the street and there was a little place around the, down the hill around the corner that I would often go to. And at that point on the corner, there were typically seven or eight men, all of whom had crutches, who would sit in one spot and they would beg. They were begging for, for people as they passed by to give them coins and things like that. And over time, over the years, in fact, uh, coming and going regularly from that spot, there was one beggar particularly that I, I sort of focused on. And I would often give him, if I had change in my pocket, I would give him something. I, I mean, what I gave him on a periodic basis. It was a ridiculously small amount of money. But I would always look for him. And it wasn't just that I would go and I'd give him money. I would stop. And uh, as you do in Ethiopian culture, I would shake hands with him and say, hello, and how are you doing? And have a bit of a chat. Now, the reason I had that story in mind to start with 
was because back at the beginning where I talked about the fact that we need to make, we need to address poverty one person at a time, that it, it's, an important, uh, it's an important step for us to make to take poverty from the broad abstract and the overwhelming down to the individual and the human. And I was perhaps a little self-servingly thinking of that as a good example of giving poverty, uh, returning to poverty, a human face and acknowledging this is not poverty, this is a man. And in fact, he's a friendly man. And as much as I stop and acknowledge him as a fellow human being, what transpires, what takes between us is something different than Steve early responding to poverty. And in fact, after, after several years, and, and I haven't been back to Ethiopia for a little while, but I, when I go back, I, ha, I still see him. His name is Haile, and I still see him. And he, you know, it's the point now where he comes running down the street, well, hobbling down the street. He's got, you know, his crutch and sort of one leg. But at any rate, um, like a long lost friend or brother. And I, I really think, I could be misleading myself, but I think the friendship has sort of gone to the level where he doesn't look upon me as a meal ticket any longer. He looked upon me as a, as a person he really enjoys seeing, who, who shares an interest with him in, in his life and, and, and sort of responds to him on that level. Okay, so that was my let's connect with the person as a response to poverty story. But, but really the better part of that story is not that part at all. So let's, let's not congratulate me for um, my good acts in that one. The story is really about Haile because... On one occasion, as I found, I went by that corner and Hiley was there. And I reached into my pocket to find something and I didn't have any change. I just had a, a 10 bur note. Still not a lot, of, a lot of money, but that was all I had. And it was enough to buy coffee, um, not a lot more. And I reached and I had this and I thought, oh, well, I've taken it out. Now it's kind of rude for me just to stick it back in my pocket. So I was going to offer it to him. And he looked at the note, and he looked at me, and he said, no. He said, um, I know that you like your coffee. That's all right. Some other time. You know, if you've got some change the next time, give it to me. Don't worry about it. He, he insisted, and, and I, you know, I didn't know if he knew whether he was going to be eating that day or not. But that was his response. He knew that that was the only 10 butter note that I had. And he knew that I liked my coffee. And he insisted that I keep it. And... I was really quite flummoxed by that, but I thought, now what do I do? And I said, well, let's go have coffee together. He said, yeah, great, that's good. Okay, let's do that. So I walked off with him, and we had our coffee, and, and I really got to know about his story, that he had been a soldier in the Ethiopian Civil War, and that he'd lost his leg fighting in the north, and that he'd, he'd, he'd only been through grade eight in school, and... Um, he came from the countryside originally, and he didn't have a trade. It was really difficult for him to make a living for himself, particularly with, with uh, one leg missing. And, and so there he was. He was begging. And he said, when I get a little extra money, I send it back to my family who live in the countryside to educate my younger brothers. And as we were chatting, I, something sort of occurred to me. I said, you know, you sit in the same spot with, uh, with six or seven other guys. He said, yeah, yeah, we were all in the military together. I said, uh, you know, when I, when I used to come down, if I offered to give you something, they would all come over and they'd say, you know, sort of, what about me? What about me? And he said, oh, yeah. He sort of laughed. He said, well, yeah, this is what happened. He said, um, he said look, I, I said to him, you know, he's a Ferengi and he has his own way of doing things. So um, when he gives me something, let me just divide it up among us and don't give him a hard time. Um, you know, just back off a little bit, but, but I'll see to it that, you know, that we divide it among us. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's fair, that's good, that's great. And I thought, now I know that the, the few bits of coin and the change that I'm giving him is a ridiculously small amount of money. But you, you see the point there. <laughs> he was more concerned that whenever I stopped by there that I wasn't troubled by a large group of men panhandling for money that were his his brothers. He said, they're, they're my brothers. They're my friends. We look after each other. So it's no problem. I, I, you know, I divide up what you give me and we share it. I, I, I wish that we could transplant that expectation about receiving into the Christian heart. 
wouldn't be a beautiful thing. A man who's probably living on, and you saw the statistics there, something like one to two dollars a day is nevertheless generous enough in spirit to say to this man who is enormously wealthy by his standards, so that it doesn't inconvenience you, I will take the little that you've given me and I'll actually divide it up with my brothers. And it's nothing to me because we're brothers. Zero sum and wealth creation models are worldly models. We can't be guided by that understanding of wealth. God told his people, if you live according to my ways, I will bless you. And you don't need to worry when you have to cancel the debts of those who borrowed from you, when you have to provide for others. You don't need to worry that you'll miss out. That's a paraphrase of what he says there. The question is, do we believe that that still applies to us today? Of course, this was written for Israel. It was written for a particular place, a particular time, in a particular society. But how much more has, done, has God done to bless us and to make us his people who had no right to call ourselves his people than, in fact, he did for Israel? If we have any questions remaining about his intentions and his goodness. I, um, I have a passage from John Piper here, and I found this a little hard to read for myself. I, it's it's kind of harsh. It's a bit pointed, but I, I think it applies, and so I'm going to bring it in at this point. Um, and John Piper, by the way, as a, as a Christian leader, as a man um, with a very successful ministry, um, as much as I understand it, he is really a man that practices what he preaches. He would be, he could be, he should be, just almost exactly like, in fact, his model for this was John Wesley, who was the very same kind of equivalent in his own day of a man who was enormously successful as a preacher and a minister, had a very high profile, had an impact on his society, was highly regarded, but not only for his preaching, but for his integrity as well. And John Wesley was a man who early in his life decided that he would live on 28 pounds a year, which at that time was kind of the equivalent of a lower middle class income, and that he would simply live on that much money each year for the rest of his life, no matter what his income was. And by the time he had established his fame and his profile, he was living on the equivalent of a very high upper middle class. I mean, he was receiving the income, of, uh, of a very high upper middle class professional. And he continued to live on 28 pounds a year for the whole of his life. John Piper is a man who, very similar convictions, it, 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 despite the fact that he's famous, is very successful in ministry, he lives modestly. Modestly and comfortably, very much like John Wesley um, suggested. And he writes, so he writes this, and I think he can say this, because there's a bit of principle and there's a bit of commitment behind it. Okay, this is what he says. God is not glorified when we keep for ourselves, no matter how thankfully, what we ought to be using to alleviate the misery of unevangelized, unmet, and unfed millions. The evidence that many professing Christians have been deceived by this doctrine is how little they give and how much they own. God prospered them. And by an almost irresistible law of consumer culture, baptized by a doctrine of health, wealth, and prosperity, they have bought bigger and more houses, newer and more cars, fancier and more clothes, better and more meat, and all manner of trinkets and gadgets and containers and devices and equipment to make life more fun. They will object. Does not the Old Testament promise that God will prosper his people? Indeed. God increases our yield, so that by giving we can prove our yield is not our God. God does not prosper a man's business so he can move from a Ford to a Cadillac. God prospers a business so that 17,000 unreached peoples can be reached with the gospel. He prospers the business so that 12% of the world's population can move a step back from the precipice of starvation. It's not just a question of our 
understanding of our view of God. Sharing what we have doesn't just change the world, it changes us. And we find that the standards that we set for ourselves and the expectations that we have for what our lifestyle needs to look like are really very flexible. And it's amazing how far back they can shift and still look very good on the basis of what we learn about generosity. And isn't that really what it's all about? We don't, as we all know, as we're all reminded constantly, we don't take any of that stuff with us into eternity. What we take is our character. That's, that's the part that God is constantly working on and constantly changing and wants to see grow and change so that we can be the kind of people that can share eternity with him. Whether we have BMW or whether we have a motor scooter, it's the kind of people we're becoming. We find that fullness of life doesn't consist in fullness of possessions as much as we share and we learn to give. And we push the boundaries of that constantly. That, riches, that richness of life is not a state that depends on the growth of the Chinese economy. And that joy, that real joy, doesn't pass five minutes after we walk out of the Marion Shopping Center. Years ago, um, when I had just come home from West Africa as an agricultural volunteer, I spent three years in a rural village in, um, on the coast of, of Sierra Leone. And I, I'd just come back to the United States. And I was visiting with my father in Seattle. And we went to a, a shopping center in a place called Bellevue, Bellevue Mall. Now, Bellevue, Bellevue, let me tell you, Bellevue is, is where the Boeing headquarters are located and Microsoft headquarters and Amazon is there. Boeing, uh, sorry, Bellevue, as you can imagine, is sort of the epitome of upper middle class America. And not only were we there in Bellevue, but we were in the Bellevue Mall. And Bellevue Mall is a pretty glitzy, pretty upmarket sort of place. I don't exactly know why we were there of all places at that point in time, but we were there. We were having coffee together, and my dad was looking around, and he'd, he'd visited me in Sierra Leone, so he sort of knew the, the background. And I wasn't long back, and he was looking around, and he was, he was obviously a little bit awkward, and I said, what is it? And he said, does all of this make you angry? And I looked around, and, and I thought, I don't feel angry. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, no, Dad, it, it doesn't make me angry. It didn't make me angry then. It doesn't make me angry now. I rejoice. I rejoice in the abundance that we enjoy in this part of the world, in this society, here as much as in the United States. I rejoice. I think it's wonderful. Honestly, a day doesn't pass that I don't think, what an incredibly wealthy place to live. Isn't it wonderful? What I... What I do struggle with is our lack of gratitude. God's wealth is infinite. It doesn't need to cost anyone else a loaf of bread, a meal for their family, that we can enjoy the wonderful things that we enjoy. Because he's limitless in his resources, and he has seen fit to bless us. And you can guess that he's sitting up there having given us all of this and saying, I really want to see what you're going to do with it now. And even that, as challenging as it is, it just doesn't get to the heart of the fact that we can, and certainly our society does, not just take it for granted. Let's face it, we've gone a step further than that. We deserve that. That's the message of the world that we live in. And how do we translate that message to the family that's living on $1.5 a day or less and has no certainty of where the meal for tomorrow will come from for the children they're trying to feed? To finish with, and to make this personal, because, I, again, the difference that we make is not the difference that we will see in the world because of the UN's initiative for the alleviation of global poverty, which, by the way, was set back in 2000 for the year 2015. Um, 
the fact that we haven't alleviated global poverty probably suggests that even the United Nations, with the cooperation, sort of, of the international community, isn't necessarily going to get the job done. But we can make a difference. We can make a difference in the world and in ourselves. That's the beauty of the Christian path and the message that Jesus gives us. We can make a difference. So I'm going to leave you with a few questions. And I think these are very personal questions. You can ask them of yourself. You can ask them in your prayers before God. They're sort of designed that way. They come from a, a writer named Randy Alcorn who, who writes about this issue. But I'm going to leave you with a few questions, okay? Question number one. What am I holding on to that is robbing me of present joy and future reward? What am I holding on to? What am I keeping that's preventing me from having to depend on you? What am I clinging to that makes me feel like I don't have to depend on you to provide, like I used to do before I had this much? What do you want me to release that could restore me to a walk of faith? Where in the world and in my community do you want me to go to see and participate in Christ-centered ministry meeting spiritual and physical needs? Am I treating you, God, as the source and the owner of my assets or am I just treating you as a consultant? Because you called the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 30, to give away all that he had and follow you in faith, is it possible that you might call me to do the same thing? Do you want me to ask? Last question. Who is my neighbor? <laughs> 